So the first thing we're going to do is install Node.js. Go ahead to Google and type Node.js. I'm going to install it for Windows. It doesn't matter where you install it, whether let's say if it's on Linux or Mac OS or any other operating system, because the behavior is going to be the same. But I'm going to download it for Windows because it's the most convenient. Now when the download is finished, click on the installer. Click on next. You can specify the directory that you want to install Node.js in. For me, I'm going to choose the default. You can see that it's going to download the Node.js runtime environment as well as the npm package manager which we're going to use to install express.js and the mongodb driver and other dependencies now the installer is finished to check if node.js is installed go ahead to command prompt or terminal if you're in case you're using Linux or Mac OS and type in node dash dash version and you can see that it is installed if you type npm dash dash version as well it gives us the version meaning that it is installed now we're gonna install react in order to install it we're gonna run the command npx create react app and our app directory I'm gonna call it app the reason we're using npx and not npm is because create react app is a package that is expected to be run only once in our project so it's more convenient to use it only once rather than download it in our machine and then use it now let's run this command It's usually going to take several minutes depending on your internet connection, so I'm going to skip to the part where it has already finished. Okay, now after downloading, you can see there's a command here called npm start, which starts the development server. So, we're going to do that. First, let's go ahead to our directory, cd app, and then let's run this command, npm start. If you see this page, then React is downloaded successfully. So, we installed React successfully and it's working properly. We're going to take a quick pause here and we'll continue the next video. After running our React app, you can see here it says edit src slash app.js. Let's go ahead and edit that file. I'm going to open this directory with my editor. And under the src directory, let's open a file called app.js. You can see here that there's a combination of XML tags and JavaScript code. This is called JSX, which stands for JavaScript XML. So how is this actually compiled to a normal browser compatible JavaScript? Well, if you open your directory again, and you open the node modules directory inside it, there's tons of packages that come by default with React. If you scroll down a little bit, you can see here that there are some packages called Babel. So what is Babel exactly? Well, Babel converts modern JavaScript to browser compatible JavaScript. And one of its features is that it converts JSX, which is a combination with JavaScript and XML tags, to a browser compatible JavaScript. And to test that, go to babeljs.io. You can find a button called try it out, click on it. And from the presets here, check the version that you want to convert from. So I'm going to check React. And then I'm going to copy and paste this function and see what it converts to. You can see that I already pasted it and it converts to something like this. So when we type something like div class name equals app, behind the scenes, there's a compiler that actually translates this to a normal JavaScript function that is react.createElementDiv. So this function here is a built-in function inside React. 
So you might be asking why we're using this method instead of this. Well, you can use either of these methods, but it's more convenient and easier to understand and more readable to write code in this format. Because once you write nested elements inside each other, you're going to have something like this, which is tedious and not really readable. So that's a quick overview of JSX and how it is translated or compiled to a normal browser compatible JavaScript. We're going to stop here and we'll continue the next video. Okay, now let's create our little basic app. Go to our directory and go to the SRC folder and delete everything in here. These files are the template files that come with React by default. And you're going to almost always want to delete them and create your own files from scratch. I'm going to delete these. And then I'm going to create a new file called index.js and we're going to write our code inside here. So the reason I named it index.js is because it's actually primary to name it like that in React. So this file is the root file that contains the application that you want. Let's go ahead and type import React from React. And then we're going to import React DOM from React slash DOM. And then we're going to render a component to our DOM. In order to do that, we're going to type react DOM dot render our component that we want. So for this example, we're going to render a basic H1 that says hello. And the location that we want to render this component on. So I'm going to type document dot query selector. And then I'm going to type hashtag root. The reason I typed this is because when you open, when you go to your directory and open the public directory, and then you go to index.html and open it with your editor, you can see here that there is a div with an ID called root. So we're basically rendering our app inside this div. So let's go ahead and save this file. You can see that it's rendered hello. If you open the inspector, you can see that our app actually got rendered inside that div with the ID root. So this is what this function is for. We're actually rendering this component inside a div called root. You can see that this works right there. But we're going to follow the convention. So the convention is that you create a new file called app.js and inside this file you actually write your logic just like the header tag and then you import this app component inside this index.js file so let's restructure our app right now first let's type in here import react from react then we're going to create a component so we're going to type const app equals function and then we're going to return h1 then we're going to export this function that we created and inside here we're going to import this app component and then we're going to call it right here and there you go it has the same result well this might seem a little bit confusing because what is a component why are we doing all these imports how how did we use this as a component as an xml tag right here Meanwhile, it's a normal JavaScript function. Let's stop here and we'll discuss these topics in the next video. Now that we wrote our app, let's explain it line by line. So the first line is that we import React from the React package. Well, if you open your node modules folder in your directory and you search for React, you can see that there's actually a React package right here. Also, there's a React DOM package right here. So technically, you can import any library or any package that is downloaded in here. But we're not going to be using any of these and we're going to be sufficient with React only. So in the same manner, we imported React from the React library. We imported React DOM from the React DOM library or package. But then we imported the component from our app.js file and then we rendered this component to the div with the ID root, as we can see here. So what is this component? Well, let's go to our app.js file and let's take a look here. 
you can notice that we imported React and then we created a function called app. And this function returned a tag or an h1 tag like so. And then we exported this function. So we can summarize this in this following diagram. You can think of a component as a JavaScript function that returns HTML or XML elements. So in here, this is the component, which is a function that returned an XML or HTML element. In the same manner, we can actually create another component in the same app.js file. Let's go ahead and type const and let's call this component test. And then let's put an arrow function. And by the way, you can create this component by either using the arrow function or the traditional function way. These ways are equivalent, but I'm going to use the arrow function because it's easier. Now let's return some um, paragraph here and let's say this is a test. And then you can see that this is a component and this is another component. In React, you can actually create custom components and then use them inside other components. So instead of writing h1 hello, you can actually type something like this, test. So when you go to your browser, you can actually see that we rendered a paragraph instead of an h1 tag. So you can create several components in the same file and you can return components from another component. Now let's suppose that we want our h1 tag to be displayed above this paragraph. We would think of doing something like this first. Let's open like parentheses so that we can wrap them with a parentheses. And we did so because we want to write multiple lines inside the return. And then let's type simply hello. If you go back to your browser, you can see that React did not like what we did. And by reading the error message, you can see that it must be wrapped in an enclosing tag. So in React, you can only return one element or one tag, let's say, from a component. So instead of writing something like this, which is one component and two components, we're returning two components from this app component, and this is illegal. We have to return only one component. There are many ways to solve this. One way is to wrap these components or these tags inside of a div tag. like so. Okay, now let's save it and test if this works or not. Yup, it does. Okay, we explained that components are functions that return JSX elements. Also, these components can actually not only return JSX elements, they can return other components that we created. But we cannot return multiple tags at the same time unless we wrap them in an enclosing tag like so okay now let's delete these and let's delete these as well and let's return it to its normal behavior okay there it is so now you might be asking why we're using this import method well as we explained before this is actually calling the react.create element method as you can see by the babel compiler here when we write something like this which is equivalent to our component, you can see that the equivalent in a browser compatible JavaScript is calling the react.create element method or function. So that's why we need to import react. Well, once again, we explained that react components are functions that return either HTML or XML elements. However, components are not only functions. We can create class components as well. So we're going to take a quick pause here and we'll explain that in the next video. Previously, we learned that there are two types of components, functional components and class components. And we tackled functional components enough that we understand what it means. In this video, we're gonna talk about class components. So let's refactor this into a class component. First, let's type the keyword class and then the component name, which is app, and let's open curl brackets. We want to write this return method here. So in class components in React, in order to render tags, you have to implement the render method. So let's type render, which is, by the way, a built-in function in React. And then inside of the, inside of the rendered function, we're going to type return h1 hello. We said that this is a built-in function provided for class components by React. But in order to use this method, we need to extend some kind of class so that we have the ability to actually implement this method. 
So basically in React, we have a class that is called component, and we refer to it as react.component. This component class contains the declarations of many methods, such as component that mount, component will unmount, and most importantly, the render method. We're going to talk about these methods later in this course, but in this video, we're going to focus on the render method. So the render method gives us the ability to render JSX tags to the screen. And actually without it, we can't show tags on our screen. So in order to use this method and define it inside of our component, we need to extend this component class. And by extend, I mean inherit. So in here, we're going to type extend and then react.component. Okay, let me break it down. So first, we type the class keyword, which is a reserved keyword in JavaScript, and we type the component name, which is app, and then we type extends react.component. The difference here is that a class component has to extend some sort of built-in class so that we have the ability to use some methods like render in order to return some tags. However, in functional components, we don't do that because when React looks at this function, it immediately considers this function to be a React component because it returns some XML or HTML or let's say JSX tags. Meanwhile, if you write the class component just like this, this is a, a normal class that has a method inside it called render. And React has no way to understand that this is a built-in function or this is a, a class component. So we're actually extending this class right here, which is react.component, in order to use some methods like this, in order for us to return some JSX tags or XML tags. Now that we refactored this functional component, we can delete it and save our file and then test it out. You can see that it gave the same results. So once again, a class component is defined as follows. The class keyword, and then you type the component name, and then you have to type this, extends react.component so that you actually inherit some of the properties that are built in inside React, which is like the built-in function render. And without this function, we can't actually return some JSX tags like this. You can also create other components inside the same file. I'm gonna name this to test, and I'm gonna return some paragraph in here. So let's type P. Um, this is a test and then you can render this component inside of an, another component so inside the app component I'm gonna type test if you save the file and go to your browser and click refresh this is actually the result so it's identical to what we've done before however there are some differences we're going to tackle in the lectures when we discuss the topic of states we're gonna take a quick pause here and we'll continue in the next video We've talked about what components are, and now we understand what a functional component is, as well as what a class component is. Right now, we're going to write our first minimal application to test our knowledge. Okay, in this application, we're going to display a header and a button, and when we click on this button, we're going to display some message in our browser's console. Okay, let's go ahead and create a new functional component called header. And inside it, we're going to return and h1 and we're going to type click the button okay this is our first component now we're going to create a class component and let's name it button notice the capital in the first letter of these components names and then let's type extends react.component and then the render method and inside it let's return a button tag that says click me okay now let's render these components inside of our app component so let's open a, a pair of parentheses and then inside of it we're going to type header and bind and this is actually wrong because we can't return two separate components at the same time we have to wrap them with an enclosing tag like a div for example can do the following and it's gonna work correctly like this but if a div breaks your CSS layout or your styling layout you can actually replace it with nothing at all just the opening tag and the closing tag so let me explain here when you write something like this 
and then you go to your browser and you open your developers tool you can see here that you're actually returning a div and inside of it your components so a div and inside of it the two components that you that we created what if this div breaks our layout well you can actually return nothing like this so if you go here and refresh you can see that we're returning these buttons immediately but we're enclosing them with an enclosing tag there's another syntax for this which is called the react.fragment like so and then you put this here and this actually returns nothing as well there you go but the difference between this and the empty tag like this is that inside the react fragment you can actually specify a props called key but we're going to talk about props and keys later in this course for now I'm just gonna put a simple div here and call that a day now if you go here if you click on this button it actually does nothing okay let's write a function for that so go ahead and type a function here called say hello and inside of it we're gonna type console.log hello notice how I use the function keyword instead of the arrow function in here in here I can use the arrow function but because we don't want to get confused with the component I just remained with the old-fashioned way and by the way we know that this is a function a normal JavaScript function and that this is a component because this function here is returning nothing at all meanwhile this component is returning some JSX or XML or HTML, whatever you want to call it. So the difference between a normal function and a component function is that a component function actually returns some JSX. Meanwhile, the normal function can return nothing or any other values. Okay, now how do we bind this function to our button here? Well, that's pretty simple. In normal JavaScript or in normal HTML, we used to do the following. We would type onClick equals double quotations and then the function name which is say hello like so however in react it's a little bit different in here because react uses the camel case style instead of writing on click like this all lowercase you need to change this C to a capital C like so also because we're in the JSX context doing something like this this is just merely a text or a string let's say so there's no way react understands that this is a function name in order to insert some JavaScript expression in here we need to wrap this instead of quotations we need to wrap it with curly brackets so curly brackets in react means that you want to insert some JavaScript expression in between the JSX context so in here you can actually write something like hello or something like that so you notice that this is a JavaScript function which evaluates to a literal string and this is a normal HTML or XML or JSX whatever you want to call it text so let's go ahead and see what happens in here you can see that there's a hello here because we return a literal string from this JavaScript expression okay let's delete that now inside of here if we call this function with the parentheses like this it's actually going to invoke this function as soon as the button is mounted on the DOM and we don't want to do that well let's see how this goes so if you go here and click refresh you can see that it prints hello as soon as this button gets mounted on the DOM well let's fix that so the solution for that is to remove the set of parentheses in here and just save it like so so we're saying here take this function called say hello and pass it to the onclick prop or onclick property or onclick attribute if you want to call it and whenever this button is clicked invoke this function that we gave you okay let's go ahead and test what we've done cool there's no hello message in the first mounting of the button and then when you click on this you can see that it works let's click two more and there it is so inside of here you can type something like on key down which is equivalent to the HTML attribute on key down and you can actually see a list of all of the events that are handled by react components inside of this page go to this page which is reactjs.org slash docs slash events.html or search for synthetic events and scroll down a little bit you can see that there's a supported events tab in here click on the mouse events link and it's going to take you down 
to the, all of the supported events by the React library. So you can see on click, on context menu, on double click, and so on. Okay, after seeing that, let's talk a little bit about our app structure. You can see here that we created a component called app and we included all of the functions and components inside of it. And then we rendered these components that we created. And then we exported that component. And inside of the index.js file, we actually imported this component called app and then we use the React DOM library to render our app on the dev with the ID root. So you might be wondering, why are we doing this? Can't we just copy and paste all of these components and functions inside of this index.js file and call it a day? Actually, yeah, we can do that. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. So I'm going to go ahead and copy all of these and then save it or delete it or whatever you want it and then paste it right here. And then I'm going to comment this out or delete it. And then I'm going to run my development server again. And you can see that the result is the same. Let's test it out. There it is. And to be even more clear, instead of rendering the app components, I can directly render these components right here, like so. Like this. Let's see if this works or not. And there you go. There it is. It says hello. So why were we separating these functions and components from the index.js file. Why couldn't we just do this and call it enough? Well, let's take a quick pause here and we'll discuss this in the next video. In the previous video, we asked, why did we put these components and functions inside the app.js and then import it inside the index.js file? And we saw that this is equivalent to just writing app in here. I'm going to answer that right now. So when you develop more complex, sophisticated and advanced apps, you're going to end up with creating so many components and you're going to end up with writing a lot of chunks of codes. So containing almost 2000 lines of codes in a single file is really a headache and really hard to maintain as well as modify. So let's raise the question again. Why do we split our components? Let's look at this diagram. Why do we split components? Well, first, it is easier to maintain and modify. And second, you achieve code reusability. So you can reuse components for other projects as well. And last but not least, it is easier for developers to read it. Without further ado, let's split our components into several files. In order to do that, we're going to follow a little convention by the React community. And that is to create a, a new folder called components. And inside of it, we're going to put all of our custom components that we created, such as the header component and the button component. So let's do that right now. Let's call this header.js and then Let's create another file called button.js. So we're going to copy the definition of the button component inside of the button.js. And as we explained before, we need to import the React library because when we compile this, it's going to invoke the react.create element function. And then we're going to export this component like so. Let's do the same with the header component. First, let's copy the definition from here and put it inside of this file and then import react and then export this component. And by the way, we forgot this function for the button component right here. Okay, after doing that, let's go ahead to the index and delete this and import the app from here and render it like so. And then we're going to export the app component. And one more thing, inside of this app.js file, we're going to import both of the button and header components. So let's type import header from components header and import the button as well. And then let's save our files and let's test it out. You can see that it works correctly. There you go. So once again, let's raise another question. Why do we have this app.js file, which contains the components, and then there's another file called index.js, and we import this app.js component, and then we render it. Let's look at this quick diagram. Okay, in this diagram, we have our project folder, which is the app folder, and inside of it, we have the 
src directory and inside it we have the index.js and app.js and then we have the components folder that contains the header.js component and bind.js component so one thing i want to mention here this is the root react file or the entry file let's say which is the file that react looks at when it runs your development server and if you change its name to something else react is going to throw an error let's go and see that so in here i'm going to change it to something like test and you can see that it gave an error that says no such file or directory and it expects the file to be named index.js okay let me revert that back to index so the convention that I was talking about is this. We have our app.js file, which is a component, which contains all of our app main logic and almost always wraps the other components that we create here with something to give to the index.js file. So basically, this is the main app file that we write our main logic inside of. And in the components directory, we create our custom components, just like we created the header component and the bind components. So briefly, this is our app structure. Inside of the src directory, we write the logic of our main app inside the app.js file, which gets imported inside the index.js file, which is the entry file, or the root react file. And inside the app component, we import other custom components, just like the header component and the button component, that are defined or implemented inside the components directory. Okay, so that's the convention that I was talking about, and that we're going to rely on in the next videos. In this video, we're going to be talking about props. Let's take a look at this diagram. So props are data that we pass from the parent components, such as the app component, down to the child component, such as the header component or the button component. And by the way, props is an abbreviation for properties. So we're passing properties from the parent component, like the app component, to the child component, like the header or the button component. Okay, let's implement props in our app. So inside of here, we don't want the header text to be hard-coded. Imagine you want to reuse this header component in other projects. Well, it's simple. We're going to use the props. So we pass props to the child components, just like we pass attributes in HTML tags. So inside of here, we're going to pass something like text, or you can call it label, or you can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it text. And then equals, and you can pass a string or a JavaScript expression. But for now, I'm going to pass a string. I'm going to type hit it, like so. So this way, we're actually passing a prop called text to the header component. Now we're going to receive it in the header.js file. So because this is a function, we need to accept the props as a parameter. So we're going to type here props. And then instead of hard coding the text right here, we're going to open two curly brackets because we want to insert some JavaScript expression here. And then we're going to delete this and type props dot and then the prop name that we passed, which is text. We're going to type here text. OK, let's save this and see how it goes. And there it is. It works. Let's do the same with the button component. OK, so inside of here, we're going to pass a prop called label. And as I recall, you can call it whatever you want. And then let's pass a string that says, hey, and then in the class component here, because we're actually extending or inheriting the react.component class, the props variable is given by default. And so we don't want to pass it as a parameter like in the functional component here. So if you put something like props like this, this is actually wrong. OK, there's a slight difference between the functional component props and the class component props. And that is just one keyword. So once again, let's delete this, open a pair of curly brackets like so. And then instead of writing props dot label immediately, we're just going to add one keyword. We're going to add the this keyword. So we're going to type this dot props dot the prop name, which is label dot label. And the reason we're using the this keyword is because we're actually in a class component. OK, let's save our file and test it out. And there you go. There it is. It changed. Let's see if it works or not. There you go. OK, so that's it. That's the prop system. You just pass properties to the child component and then accept them here and display them to the, to the user. Or you can implement some logic based on it. And the only difference between the functional components props and the class components props is that in the class component props, you're going to use the this keyword. 
Meanwhile, in the functional component, we're just passing it directly. So that's it. We're going to take a quick pause here and we'll continue the next video. Previously on this diagram, we said that when we extend the react.component class, we actually inherit some methods like these. And we mentioned that we're going to talk about these later. So what are these methods? Well, let's take a look at this diagram. These methods are called the lifecycle methods. So the lifecycle methods are called when the component first renders and then when it updates every time and when it gets removed from the DOM. Well, these are not the only methods that we have. We have even more lifecycle methods like these. However, these are very rarely used in React apps. So we're not going to talk about these methods. And instead, we're going to talk about each of these methods and what they do. So first, the component did mount method. And this method is called when the component is mounted on the DOM. In other words, when the component is first rendered on the DOM. So this method is called only once throughout the session of your app. The second method is the component did update. And this method is called each time our component is actually updated, which means every time the component is re-rendering. And we're going to talk about re-rendering when we discuss the topic of state. Third is component will unmount. And this method is called when the component is removed from the DOM or when it is hidden from the DOM. So these methods are actually only implemented for class components. However, if you want to implement them using functional components, you're going to have to use a system called the hooks system. And we're going to talk about this system later on in this course. In this video, we're going to talk about the state system. So the state system is a system that lets you store data inside of your components. So that means you can create variables inside of your component and update them and display them on your screen. Before we go into implementing the state system, I want to mention something. The state system is only used in class components. So in order to use it in functional components, you have to use a system called the hook system. And we're going to talk about it later on in this course. Let's implement the state system inside of our class component. That is the button component. So inside of the button component definition here, we're going to first implement the constructor of the class. And because we're inheriting the react.component class, we need to call its constructor as well. And we do that by invoking the method super. This is merely an object oriented concept. Anyway, underneath it, we're going to write the following statement. We're going to write this dot state, which is our state variable. And then we're going to initialize it with an empty object. So the state variable is actually an object an object that contains your variables. So inside of here, you write your variables. So let's type something like counter, which equals zero. Inside of the constructor of the class component, we initialize this dot state to be an object that contains the counter variable. So we can use this counter variable wherever we want inside of our component. So instead of writing something like this dot props dot label, we can write something like this, this dot state dot counter okay i'm gonna save it and test it out you can see that it displays zero right here because we initialize the counter variable to be zero however if we want to update it we're going to use the method called set state okay but how do we use the set state method where do we implement it well let's create a new function inside of our button com class component and let's call it handle button click and this is actually a convention name so first you type handle and then you type the tag name which is button and then you type the event name which is click okay inside of this function we're gonna write this mysterious function okay let's type this dot sit state and then type an object and then we're gonna change counter to be one so you might be wondering why are we doing why are we using this function why can't we just put something like this this dot state dot counter equals one. Well, because this is actually forbidden in React. You can't do this in React. The only way to update your state variable is by using the sit state function like this. Okay, so let's remove this and instead of here, instead of the say hello function, let's sub the this dot handle button click. And then we can remove this function. Okay, let's check it out. Let's click on the button. You can see that it gave an error. Well, we're going to explain this error in the next lecture. Okay, so the cause of this problem is that when you pass in this method to the button on click, 
event, React is going to call this method in a different context than the context of this button class. So in the context of the button class, this refers to the object of this class. However, in a different context, this refers to something unknown. And that's why it says undefined. And if you try to call a method of the undefined, like the sit state method, it's going to throw an error like this. Well, we can solve this in plenty of ways. I'm going to list three. So first, you can solve this by writing this dot handle button click equals this dot handle dot bind this. So what is this exactly? Well, the bind function binds the this keyword of this function or of this method here with the object that you specify in here. So in other words, we're replacing this object instead of this keyword right here. So that if you call this function in a different context, this keyword refers to the object of this class. Let's save it and test it out. If we click on this button, you can see that its value is updated. So the second method is, first let's remove this. The second method is by defining this method as an arrow function. So let's convert this into an arrow function. And let's test it out. And there you go, it works. So the reason behind why this works is because an arrow function automatically binds this. And last but not least, the third method. So first, let's return this to be a normal method. Let's test it out. Yup, it shows an error. So the third method is to wrap this method with an arrow function like so. So we're passing to this button, this function, and inside of it, we have the handle.button click method. And because the arrow function automatically binds the this keyword, we're on the safe side. And last but not least, we need to invoke this function inside of the arrow function, like so. And then let's test it out. There you go, it works. So it's up to you to choose one of these three ways. However, I'm going to stick with the old fashioned way, which is to call the bind method directly. So I'm going to type this dot handle click equals dot bind this. And there you go, it works. So now you might be wondering, why are we using a state variable? Can't we just define a variable like so and call it counter and then update it right here? And then instead of this, we can type something like this. Well, we can. However, the state variable or the state system forces the component to re-render whenever you make a change or an update on it. So something like this won't work because the component will not be re-rendered. Let's test it out. There you go. And if we click on it, nothing changes. And that's because the component is not re-rendering again when we change the variable. So that's why the state variable or the state system is so much powerful. Because whenever we make a change on the state variable, it forces the component to actually re-render and then display the updated value on the screen. So let's change this back to set state, change this back to this.state and remove this variable. And there you go, it works again. Now, the reason why we're saying that you have to use the sit state function instead of writing something like this immediately is because this is not going to force the component to be re-rendered or updated. So the, the value inside of here is going to remain the same. Let's test it out. See, even if we click on the button, it does not update. So the sit state method forces the component to re-render when we make a change or an update on our state variable. Let's change this back to sit state. Okay, so now we understand the state system. We're going to take a quick pause here and we'll continue in the next video. In this video, we're going to make a minimal application that counts the seconds that we spend on our website. So we need a header like this to show a text that says you spent and then beside it, we need to show the actual seconds that we spent. I'm going to implement this using the state system and the lifecycle methods. So first, we can refactor this 
component here but it would be easier to delete it and create a new component so I'm gonna do that right now delete and then inside of the components file we're gonna create a new file and let's call this component counter.js and inside of here we're gonna import we're gonna import the normal stuff and then create a new class component called counter that extends react.component then we're gonna export this component let's test this component out let's say re render and then return something like this and inside of the app.js file instead of importing the button component we're gonna import the counter component and here as well and so is here let's delete this and put counter okay let's test it out there it is it works okay now let's implement some logic in here so inside of the counter class component we need to set up an interval that runs a certain function every one second and this function is going to call the sit state to some certain variable inside of our class component and then we're going to show it up on the screen so how are we going to do this well first let's set our state variable inside of our class component and we already learned how to do that by defining the constructor and then let's type this dot state equals an empty object and we said that this is the only case where we can use this dot state directly like this which is inside of the constructor and then let's type counter and let's initialize it with zero and we said that because we're extending the react.component class we need to call the constructor of the base class which is this class constructor okay now we need to show the counter on the screen so instead of typing test in here let's type this dot state dot counter let's save our file and let's test it out there it is it works now we need to somehow implement some logic to attach a timer that updates our state variable here every one second well there's a built-in function inside of javascript which is called sit interval and then you specify the function here and the time and so it calls this function that you specify every one second for example in here and if you put something like two it's gonna call it every 2000 millisecond which is every two seconds so where are we gonna put this interval well you say how about we put it inside of the constructor of our component well it seems a little bit unlogical to bind or to attach a timer to a component that doesn't exist on the DOM yet because when we call the constructor the component is not rendered on the screen or on the DOM so it would make no sense to attach a timer to our component when it doesn't even exist in the first place so we're gonna make use of the lifecycle methods right now and we're gonna use this inside of the component did mount function so right after rendering our component for the first time we're gonna attach a timer to it so let's say this dot timer equals and by the way you can call this whatever you want this is merely an instance variable or a member variable of this class so this is not some magic or some built-in react variable or anything like that this is merely object oriented programming and then let's type sit interval a function and then call this function every 1000 milliseconds which is every one second and then inside of this function we're gonna type this dot sit state and we're gonna change the counter to be this dot state dot counter plus one and you can see that we're defining a variable here that does not exist in the class in the first place so it would make more sense to define this variable inside of the constructor first and assign it to something like null so that our class knows that there's an instance variable called timer and then later on after the first render of our component we attach a timer to it and we assign it to our timer variable okay now that we got this let's test it out and there you go it's counting each second by the way let's change this text to something like you spent okay now let's test it out again and there you go one last thing that we forgot to do now when the counter component gets removed from the DOM 
the interval is going to remain. So we need somehow to clear or free the timer or interval that we just set. And in order to do that, we're going to use the component will end amount lifecycle method. Okay, let's type component will end amount. And then we're going to clear this timer that we just set. And in order to do that, we're going to type in here clear interval and the timer that we have. So first, we're defining the state variable and we're initializing our counter state variable to be zero. And then we're initializing the timer variable to be null. And then after rendering our component for the first time, after returning some JSX tags in here, we're going to attach an interval or a timer, let's say, that changes our state variable every one second. And when the component gets removed from the DOM, we need to free this timer inside of the component will end mount lifecycle method. So that's a practical example of using lifecycle methods inside of our class components. Okay, that's it. We're going to take a quick pause in here and we'll continue in the next video. In this video, we're going to make a minimal app that contains of a form and inside it, we have an input tag and a submit button. And whenever we enter some data and click submit, an alert message shows up with the data that we submitted. Okay, let's do that right now. First, let's delete these files here. And then let's create a new component called form with an uppercase F .js and import react. And then let's type class form extends react.component. And then let's test it out. Let's type render return h1 hello. And last but not least, let's export it. And here, let's remove one of these and replace this with form and this form. Let's delete this and delete this as well. Okay, there it is, it works. Now let's insert our form elements. So first, in here, let's replace this with parentheses like this, and then type form, and inside of it, we're gonna create an input tag of type text, and let's give this an ID of, let's say, name, and close it. And then let's create another input tag that is the submit button. Okay, there it is. However, when we put some information here and click submit, nothing happens. It just redirects and really nothing shows up. Well, we're going to handle form submittal through the unsubmit event handler. So let's type unsubmit equals, and inside of here, we're going to type the function name that we want to use in order to handle this submit. So let's type this dot handle form submit. And let's create this function. So let's type handle form submit. And let's just for testing, let's console.log. Hey. Okay, let's go ahead here. Let's open our console. And then if we submit in here, you can see that it shows a hey message and then it redirects immediately. So let's prevent our form from redirecting. Well, we do this by invoking the event dot prevent default and you know that the event object is sent to every event handler function so it is sent automatically to the handle form submit and by doing this we're actually preventing our form from doing its default behavior which is redirect to the specified url but we didn't specify it in here but usually form tags have an action attribute which specifies the url to redirect to and by doing this, we're actually preventing it from doing it. So let's save this and test it out. Okay, now let's click Submit. And you can see that it does not redirect anymore. And there it is. It says, hey. Okay, now in order to solve the previous error that we encountered, which is the binding of the this keyword, we use the first method, which is the, the function name dot bind. Now let's use the arrow function. So let's convert this into an arrow function, like so. 
like this. And it still works fine. However, how do we get to use the value of this input tag in here and actually display it on the alert message? So let's type alert here and let's type hey. If you click submit, it shows the message with hey. But we want to show the message that we entered inside of the input tag. The first thing that comes to our mind is that we want to use some built-in JavaScript function just like the document.query selector. And well, in this video, we're going to use it. However, it is not the efficient way to use in such scenarios. But anyways, we're going to use it. And in the next video, we're going to talk about what is the best method to use. So let's type something like document.query selector. And because we gave this an ID, we're going to type in here name. And now this resembles this tag in here. So this tag in here is identical to the document.query selector hashtag name. And then let's type dot value. Let's save this inside of a variable. Let's call it value. And then we're going to alert it. Let's type value like this. Now if we input anything in here and click submit, you can see that it works perfectly. However, just like I said a moment ago, this is not the best way to use. We're going to introduce an easier way that is used by the whole React community and that makes it more convenient for you to write React app. Let's stop here and we'll talk about it in the next video. In the previous video, we talked about this solution here. But in this video, we're going to talk about the better solution. And so we're going to introduce the concept of controlled components. So what is a controlled component? Let's take a look at this quick diagram. So a controlled component is a form element such as an input tag, text area, and so on, whose value is controlled by its parent element and by the parent element's state variable, making the parent element's state variable be the single source of truth, which is the only way that its value can change. So we're saying here the only way that the form element's value can change is through the state variable of the parent element. And the parent element in this case is the form element that wraps it. Okay, so why controlled components? Why do we use the concept controlled components? Well, the answer is simple because it makes validation a lot easier and more flexible. And as you write more sophisticated and advanced React apps, you're going to see that this is the go to solution. Okay, now let me explain controlled components in this diagram. So first, we have the parent element, which is the form tag. And by the way, the form tag and every JSX tags are components. However, they are built-in components inside React. But components that we create are called custom components. However, we refer to built-in components such as the form, input, div, and so on as tags to avoid confusion and for simplicity. So back to this example. We have the parent element, which is a form tag, and it has a state variable with the property called C value, which stands for controlled value, and it has a value of test. And then we're going to pass this state down to the child component, which is the input tag, and we're going to set the value of this input tag to be this.state.c value. So the value of this child component is controlled by its parent component. And so the state variable of this form is the single source of truth. Okay, now let's implement this concept into our application. First, let's define the state. So let's type constructor and then call the super and then type this dot state equals an empty object. And inside of it, we're going to type value and we're going to initialize it with um, write your name. And then down here, we're going to type value equals this dot state dot value. Okay, let's save this and see what happens. If you refresh the page, you can see that the value of the input tag is changed. However, if you write something or try to delete something, it doesn't respond because it is stuck to the value of the state variable. So we need a way to somehow change the state variable to the value that we type inside of the input. Well, we do this by defining the onChange event handler. So let's type onChange and then let's type this dot handle input change. Okay, let's define this function. So first let's type handle input 
change. And then we're going to receive the event object here. And then we're going to type as simple as this. This dot sit state the value property to be event dot target dot value. And to avoid the problem that we ran across previously, let's implement the third method, which is to wrap this function here inside of an arrow function. Let's type like this and then let's put parentheses here. And of course, we need to pass the event object here and pass it down to our handle input change method. Let's save this and test our code. You can see that it says write your name and then if you type something, it works. So let me explain what happened here. Well, in the onChange event handler, what we're basically doing is that every change inside of the input tag call this function. And this function updates the state variable with the value of the input. So basically, this event handler tracks each key pressed inside of the input tag. So when you press like A, the onChange event handler is called. And so this arrow function is called with the event object. And the event object contains the target variable, which refers to the input tag. And when we say dot value, we're referring to this letter that we just wrote. So it takes this letter, assigns it to the value state variable, and then re-renders the whole element. And then when we say value equals this dot state dot value, we're actually putting the A letter here. So once again, we define the state variable with a property called value, and it has this string. And inside of the input tag, we put the value of it to be this dot state dot value, which equals write your name. And every change on the input is assigned to the state variable. And so when we update the state variable, we cause the component to re-render. And when it re-renders, the value of the input gets updated to be the new value of the state variable, which is the new value that we insert on the on change event handler and that's it really now instead of doing something like this we can just type in here this dot state dot value and that's it so let's revert back to our application refresh it and then let's type something like this and click submit there it is and you can do something like dot to uppercase so that every letter inside of the input is converted to an uppercase letter like so and you can do to lowercase and you can do a lot of things which makes validation a lot easier and more flexible okay we're going to take a quick pause here and we'll continue in the next video so far we've been using concepts like lifecycle methods such as the component did mount and the state system inside of class components only but what if we wanted to use these concepts inside of functional components? Well, we're going to need to introduce a new system called the hooks system. So what is it exactly? Well, it is a system that supplies you with methods that lets you use concepts like the state system and lifecycle methods inside of functional components. And these methods are built in inside of the React library. And they are the useState method and the useEffect method. And we're going to talk about them in the next videos. And after that, we're going to explain the difference between a functional component and a class component. So let's stop here and we'll talk about them in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about the first hook, which is the use state hook. This hook lets you use the state system inside of functional components. Okay, let's implement it. We're going to refactor our counter application that we did before. So first, inside of the components folder, I'm going to create a new file called counter.js. And then I'm going to import React. And then I'm going to create a functional component this time. So let's type const counter equals. And then let's export this component. So type export default counter. And for testing, let's return some h1 in here. So let's type test. And then inside of the app.js file, let's import it and then let's render it okay let's test it out and there you go it works okay so now how do we implement the use state hook well before we do that let's actually build the template for our component so in here let's type something like this first we want to display a message so let's type span and let's type 
you collect and we're gonna leave some space in here so that we put the state variable inside of here and then let's type clicks and then let's put a break tag and let's put a button which says click me and we're gonna attach an event handler on this button and let's call it handle button click and notice that we're not using the this keyword because we are inside of the functional component so it is unnecessary to use the this keyword inside of the functional component so we're going to just type it like that and then let's create another function inside of the functional component so let's type function handle button click and I use the keyword function and not the arrow function so that it doesn't confuse us between the two. However, you can use the arrow function here and it will show no error. Okay, and inside of here, we're going to type the logic that we want. So this is the template that we want to use for our app. Now we need to implement the state system inside of our functional component. So first, because we said that the useState hook is a built-in function or method inside of the React library, we need to import it from React. So in here, let's type import useState. Okay, now that we imported that, we need to use it inside of our functional component. And this is how we use it. So first, let's type const and then let's open two brackets first let's type the state variable name and let's call it clicks and then let's type the function name that updates our state variable so let's call it sit clicks and then we're gonna type equal use state open two parentheses and inside of the parentheses we're gonna put the initial value of the state variable that we initialize here so we're gonna initialize our state variable clicks with zero Okay, so let me explain what happened here. First, we imported the use state from the React library, and then we used array destructuring, and then we defined a variable called clicks to be our state variable, and then we defined a function called sit clicks to be our function that updates our state variable, and then we initialized our clicks state variable with zero. So this is how you use the use state hook inside of functional components. Array destructuring, the state variable, the function that updates our state variable, and then the hook name, which is use state. And after that, you put the initializer, which is the value that you initialize your state variable to. So now let's use the sit clicks function to update our state variable. Inside of the handle button click, we're going to type sit clicks and then we're going to type clicks plus one and that's it really all we got to do now is display the click state variable so inside of the asterisk here we're going to type two curly brackets and then type clicks and last but not least we need to wrap this with an enclosing tag so let's type div this time or you can use an empty tag or you can use react.fragment however i'm going to keep it simple and use the div tag okay let's test it out you can see that it initializes with zero and if we click on the button it changes to one and so on so that's how you implement the use state hook inside of functional components next we're going to talk about the use effect hook in this video we're going to talk about the use effect hook which lets you use life cycle methods inside of functional components However, the use effect is called based on several occasions. Let's take a look at these occasions. Okay, so the first occasion is every time. The use effect is called on every time the component renders. So on the first render and on each update. And this kind of reminds us of the component did update lifecycle method. However, the component did update lifecycle method does not get invoked on the first render. However, the use effect does. The second occasion is on the first render only. And this reminds us of the component did mount lifecycle method, which gets called when the component is mounted on the DOM. And the last occasion is first render plus conditionally. And we're going to see what we mean by conditional. Okay, now let's implement these occasions and the use effect hook in general. So first, let's create a new component called test and then import react. And then let's create a functional component called test and let's return some jsx in here let's type test 
And last but not least, let's export it. And then the app.js file, let's import this component and let's render the component. And there it is, it works. Now let's implement the use effect hook. As we did with the use state hook, we're going to import the use effect from the React library. So type use effect like this. And make sure to put the curly brackets just like we did in the use state hook. Now inside of the component, it's going to be a little bit different from the use state hook. Well, let me define it and you're going to see by yourself. So let's type use effect. And then inside of this, we're going to write a function as a callback. So I'm going to put an arrow function inside of here. And then let's put something like console.log page. Okay, so this is how we use the use effect hook. First, you put the use effect hook and inside of it, you put a callback function to be invoked whenever the use effect hook is called. And by the way, this is the first occasion which gets called every time. Okay, let's save this and test it out. Let's go here, click refresh, open your console and you can see that there's a hey message as soon as it renders. Okay, so this is the first occasion which gets called every time on each render on each update. The second occasion is on first render only. So how do we implement this? Well, beside your callback function, the arrow function that we just specified, put a comma and then type an empty array like so. So this tells React to call this function only on the first render of this component. And if we test it out, you will not see the difference. However, we're going to make an app later on to see the difference. Okay, so this is called on the first render only. And we know that because we specified an empty array here. And if you want this method to be called every time, we just remove this array and remove this comma. And this gets invoked on each update. Okay, so the third occasion is first render plus conditionally. So that means it's going to be called on the first render just like the second occasion and conditionally. What do we mean by conditionally? Well, that means that it depends on whether a certain variable has been updated or not. Okay, let's implement this. So in the second occasion, we used to put an empty array like so. And this indicates that it's going to be called only once on the first render. However, if we want to make it conditionally, we're going to put some data in here. And by data, I mean a variable name. So let's type test var. So what is going to happen now? Well, the use effect hook is going to be called on the first render and on each time the test var variable is updated. So the first thing, it's going to render the h1 tag and then it's going to call the use effect for the first time and print a hey on the console. And then whenever this variable is updated or its value gets changed, this method is going to be called again as opposed to the first render only occasion. Okay, so these are the three occasions of the use effect hook. Let's take a quick pause here and we'll continue in the next video. In this video, we're going to refactor the seconds counter component to a functional component and use the hooks and the state systems inside of it. So this is how the app should act. It counts the seconds we spent on the website. Okay, first, let's create a functional component called seconds. And then let's return this JSX tag. Of course, because we're in a functional component, we're going to remove this dot state and keep it just counter. Then we're going to import the use state hook and the use effect hook. So let's type use state and then use effect here. After that, we're going to create a state system inside of the functional component. So let's type counter and set counter equals use state zero. Okay, now we have the state system ready. However, we need to call the sit counter to update our counter state variable. So in the class component, we use the component did mount lifecycle method to set our timer that updates our state variable. We're going to do something similar inside of the functional component here. So let's type use effect. And then we're going to put our callback function like so, an arrow function. And then because we want this to be called only on the first render, just like the component did mount, we're going to specify an empty array here. So let's type an empty array like so. 
Now we need to implement our logic inside of the use effect hook. Okay, let's create a timer inside of our use effect hook. So let's type const timer equals sit interval. And by the way, we didn't use something like this dot timer because this is a functional component. Okay, and then let's type a function here, which is our updater function. And let's type counter plus one. And we want this interval to be called every 1000 milliseconds, which is one second. Okay, so we created our state system. Our state variable is called counter. Our updater function is called sit counter. Then we imitated the component did mount lifecycle method by using the use effect hook. And inside of it, we initialize a timer that updates our counter state variable each one second. And last but not least, we displayed the counter state variable. Okay, now we can delete this. And before running, this is actually not going to be working correctly. And I'm going to explain why in a second. So first, let's run it. You can see that it turns from 0 to 1 and then it gets stuck. So why this doesn't work? Okay, let me explain here. Inside of the sit interval function, we're not actually getting the updated version of the state variable. So the first time we render, we're actually setting counter to be 0 plus 1, which is 1. And then we're repeating that process over and over because we're not getting the updated version of the state variable counter. And thus, we just keep repeating the process 0 plus 1. So we need a way to get the updated version of the counter state variable inside of the sit counter updater function. Well, as documented by the React documents, you can use a function inside of the updater function or updater method to update our state variable. So let me implement what I just said. First, let's remove this and then let's put a function here, I'm going to make it an anonymous arrow function like so to save lines of codes. And then let's open it like this. So all we did here is that inside of the sit counter updater function, instead of providing the updated variable immediately, we're providing it with a function. And this function receives the counter state variable inside of here, which by the way is provided by the React library. And then in order to update this variable, we return the updated image of the variable. So we're returning the updated version of the state variable from this arrow function here. And this is how we update the state variable inside of this function here. We return the new updated version of the state variable, like so. Okay, let's save this and test it out. And you can see that it works properly now. And by the way, you can reduce the amount of codes that you write here by removing the return statement here, like so. And remove the enter semicolon and then remove the two curly brackets here. And if we provide one statement without curly brackets, the modern JavaScript interprets that as a return statement. And here, because we're accepting one parameter only, we can remove the parentheses, like so. And there you go, it still works. So the reason we're using a function instead of directly updating the state variable like this is because in this way, we're not actually getting the updated version of the state variable. Meanwhile, if we pass a function like this, as documented by React documents, React guarantees that the counter state variable here passed to our function here is 100% the updated version of the state variable. Notice the number of lines of codes we use inside of the functional component and the class component. In a functional component, you write list code with the same results like so. However, we still have one problem. When I change the text here and save the file, the component is going to be unmounted from the DOM and then mounted again and mounting the component again causes another timer to be set. So inside of this app, we actually have two timers. Okay, so the solution for this is pretty simple. We need to implement the component will unmount lifecycle method. How do we do that with the use effect hook? As documented in the React documents, we just return a function like this. So this function here is going to be called when the component unmounts. So inside of it, we're going to clear the timer that we have. So we're going to type clear interval and type the timer ID, which is our timer variable. And let's save this. Okay, now let's refresh the page. Okay, it works properly. Let's add a, an S here and save it so that we cause the component to be unmounted from the DOM. And you can see that it still works fine because when the component is unmounted, 
we actually cleared the timer and then we set a new timer and whenever we unmount the component again we're gonna clear it so that we don't have any timer interference okay we refactored the seconds counter app to a functional component however the use of the return statement right here is different based on the occasion that you specify and in the next video we're going to talk about it so let's stop here and we'll continue in the next video in this video we're going to talk about the occasions of when the return statement is going to be called in the use effect hook so first when the occasion is either every time or first render plus conditionally the return statement is going to be called on the next render of each update so on the first render the use effect is going to be called and if there is a change or an update, the component is going to be re-rendered. And before calling the use effect hook, the return statement of the first render is going to be called before. And then the use effect of the second render gets called after. And second, on the first render occasion. And as we learned that before, the function inside of this return statement is going to be called when the component gets unmounted. Okay, so let's implement the first occasion here. So inside here, let's create another use effect hook, like so. And inside of it, let's put an arrow function, like so. And then let's type console.log every time. So this line of code is going to be executed on each render. Okay, let's test that. And there it is. Let's lower the duration here. Let's make it 3 seconds or 5 seconds. So I'm going to change this to 5,000. Okay, now we can see it even better. There it is. Now let's put this return statement inside of this use effect hook. Let's type return. Let's type console.log called before the render of the next update. So let's save that. Let's go here, clear the console. Let's refresh the page and there it is. First, it writes every time. And after five seconds, it calls the return statement of the first render, and then it calls the second render. Now, on the first render plus conditionally, it's going to behave the same if we type something like counter in here, because the counter state variable is going to be changed every time. So it's going to behave the same as not writing anything at all. However, when you put another variable that does not get changed on each update, the behavior of this hook is going to differ from the behavior of not specifying anything at all. However, let's just put the counter state variable here and see what happens. And there you go, the every time console message. And then after it, it prints this message. And the return statement of the last occasion, which is the first render only, is like so. So when we first render, this is going to be called and then when the component gets unmounted from the DOM this message is going to be displayed so let's change the message here to be more specific called before and mounting let's refresh that and you can see that it does not change for now until we change a text here so let's delete this s here let's change and there it is called before and mounting let's put this back here and that's it really one more thing to mention, the return statement inside of the use effect hook is not to be confused with the return statement inside of the updater function here. So this return statement is there to update our state variable. However, this return statement is there to behave as a callback. So do not confuse the return statement of the use effect with the return statement of the updater function, which is sit counter. And that's it. Let's stop here and we'll continue in the next video. So far, you might be wondering if we can use the state system inside of class components and inside of functional components, then what's the difference between them? Well, in React 16.8 and beyond, the React team introduced a new concept called the hooks system. And in modern React, there's actually no difference between a functional component and a class component. However, before React 16.8, there was actually a huge difference between the two. So functional components were used only to render JSX tags and class components were used when the developer wanted to implement some logic or use the state system inside of their component. So functional components were used to only render bare JSX tags. And if you wanted to implement logic and use the state system inside of it, you're going to want to convert to a class component. And that's before React 16.8. 
where in React 16.8 and beyond, the team introduced the hook system, and now there's actually no difference between the two. So should you use functional components or class components? Well, it's a matter of preference. If you love to use functional components, use them. And if you love to use class components, use them as well. However, the React team is showing so much potential in functional components using the hook system. So I think the modern React development is going to be functional components. And that's it really. Let's stop here and we'll continue in the next video. In order to make requests inside of React, we need to make use of one of these things, Axios or Fetch. So Axios is a library that you install inside of your project directory and then you can use it to make requests from inside of your React script. However, fetch is a built-in JavaScript function that makes requests from inside of your script. Both are widely used, however, there are some differences between the two. So in fetch, when you request something and you get the response back, you actually need to convert the response to JSON manually. However, Axios does this for you automatically. It converts the response to JSON automatically. Also, Axios has a protection system for CSRF attacks. Meanwhile, Fetch does not. But anyways, both are widely used. However, we're going to install Axios and use it because it's more elegant and easier. Okay, inside of your directory, we're going to install Axios. So type npm install Axios. After installing, we're going to import the Axios library inside of our app file. Okay, so inside of the app.js file, we're going to type import Axios from Axios, like so. Let's save it and run our app to test if it works or not. You can see that there's actually no errors when we run our app. This is just a warning that tells us that we define Axios but we're not using it anywhere. And this is not an error. So, this indicates that we installed Axios properly. Okay, let's take a quick pause here and we'll continue in the next video. Okay, now we're going to use the Axios library. And to use it, we're going to create another app called the Article Searcher app, which searches the Wikipedia using the Wikipedia API. And we're going to use the Axios library to make requests to the Wikipedia API. Okay, let's create this app. Inside of our components folder, let's delete the seconds app because we don't want it anymore. Or you can keep it. And then let's create a new file. Let's call it search.js. Inside of it, let's import React. Let's create a functional component called search. And inside of it, let's return some JSX. Let's return h1 test. Last but not least, let's export this component. And then let's replace the seconds component with the search component. Okay, let's run our app and test it out. You can see that it works correctly. So let's replace this with um, a form. And then inside of it, let's create an input tag of type text. However, if you didn't write the type, the default type of the input tag is text. And there you go, it works. However, we need to import a CSS library to make this look appealing. So I'm going to use the semantic UI CSS library. You can search for semantic UI CDN and then click on the first link, which is cdnjs.com. And then you can copy the link for the CSS file here. Then inside of your project directory, go to your public folder and then open your index.html file inside of your public folder. You can insert it wherever you want inside of the head tag. However, I'm going to insert it above the title tag, like so. Okay, now we can use semantic UI. So let's go ahead and type class name equals UI4. And you can see that the changes are already applied. Let's make the search bar a little bit smaller. And in order to do that, we need to wrap this with a grid system. And a grid system is already implemented inside of the semantic UI CSS library. Okay, go to your app.js file. And then instead of returning this, let's return a div and then close the div. And then let's add a class name for this div to be UI grid container. And then inside of this, let's create another div and put the search component inside of it, like so. And then let's add a class name for this to be column 8 wide. And here we forgot to add center aligned to actually make it aligned in the center of the page. And there you go. It looks better now. Let's add a placeholder. So let's type something like this. 
first let's expand this tag like so because we inserted more than one attribute inside of the input tag we expand it like so placeholder let's type search wikipedia three dots and it already looks good now okay let's turn this input into a controlled component so let's make use of the use state hook let's create our state system here And default is going to be empty string. And then let's type value equals curly brackets value. And then on change equals. I'm going to write an anonymous arrow function directly here. So I'm going to type something like this. And then I'm going to type set value to be e.target.value. Then let's accept the event object as a parameter. Okay, let's save and go to our page. And there you go, it works. Now, this component is a controlled component. Underneath the search bar, we need to list our articles that we found from the Wikipedia API. So, let's create a component for that. Under the components, let's create a new file called list.js. Let's import React. Let's create a functional component called list. And then let's export it. And then let's return some JSX from here. Let's return h1 test as usual however we're not going to import the list component inside of the app.js file we're going to import it inside of the search.js file so import the, com the list component like so and then let's render it underneath the form like so however we need to wrap these tags with an enclosing tag you can wrap them by a div an empty tag or by react.fragment and because dev is going to break our layout i'm going to type react.fragment like so okay let's save this and test it out and there you go you can see that it works okay instead of returning some text let's return some actual content in here so let's write dev and then let's add a class name for this called ui segment and then we're going to create an anchor tag href hashtag for now and then let's call this page test let's add a class name for this header and then underneath it let's type something like a paragraph this is a test page let's save this and see how it goes you can see that it works however the anchor is a little bit small okay let's change that you can change the anchor style or you can just wrap it by an h3 tag like so or let's say h2 and you can see that it is bigger now okay let's stop here and in the next video we're going to be making some requests using the axios library in this video, we're going to be making requests to the Wikipedia API using the Axios library. Okay, we need to make a request whenever the value of the input is changed. And that means we're going to use the use effect hook. Okay, we imported the use effect hook. Now we're going to use it. So let's type use effect and then make an arrow function inside of it. However, we need to specify another argument in here, which is an array with the value state variable inside of it so that we call this function whenever this value is changed. Okay, and inside of here, let's make our requests. So first, let's import Axios like so. And then we're going to make the request here. First, let's type if value. And then inside of here, let's make our request because we don't want to make a request with an empty value because the use effect is called on the first render as well. And in the first render, the value equals nothing. So we don't want to send a request to the Wikipedia API with an empty string. Okay, then let's type axios.get and then the URL here, we're going to specify the Wikipedia API URL and then we're going to specify the options that we're going to include in this request. So the Wikipedia API URL is as follows https english.wikipedia.org slash w slash api.php I'm gonna put this URL in the resources of this lecture and then inside of the options object we're gonna specify the params of this request and the params property accepts another object like so and then we're gonna type action query list search origin star format json as our search our value so these params is equivalent to writing the params right here, like action equals query and so on. However, we put them like this to make it more elegant. So we typed axios.get and then the URL that we wanted and the options included in this request. You can also specify some headers and other properties. 
However, we're going to suffice with the params property. And these properties, action, list, origin, format, as our search, are actually provided by the Wikipedia API. And typing this is equivalent to typing something like this. Action equal query, list equal search, and so on. Okay, now axios.get, this function returns an object, an object with a response. So let's define a variable and assign this object to it. So let's type const response equals axios.get, like so. However, in this way, we're actually sending a request on each key press. We're sending a request whenever the value is changed, and the value changes whenever we press a key. Well, this is kind of inefficient, so we need to make somehow a timer to count for one second or so whenever we type something. And then, after the duration is over, we can finally make our request. Okay, let's do that. So underneath this, let's type const timer ID equals set timeout, and then inside of it a function, like so. And then, we're going to call this function after 1000 milliseconds, which is after one second. And inside of the timer, we're going to insert our function, which is this request. So by this way, we're actually making sure that the request is made after one second of typing and not on every key press. Okay, then for testing, let's console.log the response object. And by the way, this is not going to work. Why? Because exist.get is an asynchronous function, which means it's going to work asynchronously or in other words, in the background. So JavaScript is going to execute this, and then it's going to move on to console.log immediately. And JavaScript is going to print response, which is not finished yet. So how do we deal with this? Yup, you guessed it. We're going to use the async and await keywords. So let's wrap this function by an async keyword like so. And then we can use the await keyword here, because we wrapped our function with an async. Okay, let's type await. Okay, now our request is working properly. However, whenever a user enters two keys, for example, let's say A and B, a timer for the letter A is going to be set, and then another timer for the letter B is going to be set again. So we're going to end up with two timers in total. This is inefficient, and it's going to make our app act weirdly. So whenever we make an update to the value variable, we need to clear the first timer that we set. And as we learned before, we can do this by supplying the return statement of the useEffect hook. So let's type return and then let's clear timeout timer ID. However, the timer ID here is local to the scope of this if statement. So we just need to define this outside of the if statement here and then assign it right here. So we can use it instead of the return statement here. So let's remove the const here and then let's type let timer ID equals null. And I use that let keyword and not the const keyword because we're going to assign a value to it later on in the code. Okay, now our application is going to work properly. Let's test it out. Let's open our page and open our console. And then if you open the network tab, let's type something like cars. You can see that after one second, a request to the Wikipedia API is made right here. And you can see that the parameters like action equals query and list equals search is like how we specified them right here. And these parameters are actually provided by the Wikipedia API itself. You can see that we printed the response object to our console. So let's take a look at it. In the console tab, you can see that there's an object here. If you open it, you can see many properties. However, we're most interested in the data property because it contains the actual data of the response. So let's open it, and then let's open the query property of the data property. So let's click on it, and then open the search property, and you can see that it is an array of 10 elements. And each element of this array contains a title and a snippet. Okay, let's stop here, and we'll deal with the response object in the next video. In this video, we're going to be displaying the response object inside of the list component. First, instead of getting the whole response object, let's destructure this to the data object only. We're doing this because we're most interested in the data object and nothing else. Now, let's pass this data object down to the list component. So first, let's define a state variable called results and a state function called setResults. 
use state and because the result is going to be an array we're going to specify an empty array to our results state variable like so now we're going to set the result state variable instead of printing the response to the console so let's type set results data dot query dot search as we saw before and the reason i'm using the state system here because we want our component to re-render and when we pass the data object to the list component we make sure that it is the updated version of the data object and not an older version so that's why i'm using the state system here to make sure that we pass the updated data to the list component now let's pass the result state variable to the list component so let's type results equals results and then inside of the list.js file, we're going to accept it as a prop here. We're going to destructure the props object and only get the results property out of it. Now, this is our template. We need every article to be wrapped by this template. So instead of typing test page, we need to display the article title here. And instead of this paragraph, we need to display the article snippet. So how do we do that? We need to somehow apply this template on each item of the results array. We do that by using the map function. So let's type const rendered list equals results dot map like so. And then let's accept a parameter here called item. So item refers to every item inside of the results array. And then let's return some JSX here. Let's copy this and paste it down here and let's make our modifications. So instead of the test page, we're going to type item dot title. And then instead of the random text here, let's type item.snippet. These properties, title and snippet, are provided by the Wikipedia API, which are included in the response object that we received from the Wikipedia API. So now, let's explain what happened here. Well, the map function executes this function, the inner function here, on each element of the results array. And we're actually applying the changes on each item by using the return statement here. And then after executing this function here, the inner function, on each element, the map function takes every updated item and saves it in another array and then returns it. And as a result, the rendered list variable is assigned an array of the updated items. And by updated items, I mean the items that this function was applied to. And in other words, the rendered list contains an array and each item inside of this array contains this code here. So all that's left to do is to render the rendered list array. So first, let's delete this and then simply type rendered list. And when React sees that you rendered a list, it's going to render each element inside of it automatically. So let's save this and test it out. OK, now let's type something like books. And there you go. However, there are two things here. You can see that there are some actual HTML tags in here like span class equals search match and this is wikipedia's style of emphasizing the description of the article so we're gonna fix this and the next thing is if you open your console you can see that there's an error here that says each child in a list should have a unique key well let's stop here and in the next video we're gonna solve these problems let's solve the first problem we need to somehow execute this tag here and show only the content inside of it so how do we do that? We can do that by using these dangerously set inner HTML prop. Okay, let's use it. Inside of the list component on the paragraph tag, let's specify the following prop. Let's type dangerously set inner HTML like so, and then the equal sign and a JavaScript expression. And then inside of it, this prop accepts an object. So this is the first pairs of curly brackets. And inside of it, let's create another pairs of curly brackets like so. And then let's type two underscores like so. HTML, the colon symbol, and then the code that we want to set this tags in our HTML to. So we're going to copy the item.snippet and paste it here and remove this. Okay, so what is this prop exactly? Well, the dangerously sit inner HTML prop is a reserved prop in React, and it is used to display the text and not sanitize it. So if the text contains HTML tags, the HTML tags inside of the text is going to be executed. So let's save this and test it out. And there you go. You can see that there's no more span tags in here. And that's because the span tags are not sanitized. 
And this is dangerous because if the text that you have here contains a script tag or malicious code, it can actually run JavaScript on your browser. And this is the definition of XSS attacks. So you have to carefully use this prop and you have to trust that the text that you insert here is not malicious at all. So that's why React calls this prop as dangerously sit in our HTML. Okay, now let's change the href of the anchor tag here so that it actually leads to the article page. Okay, let's type https slash slash english or en dot wikipedia dot org slash c u r i d equals and then we need to specify the page ID here. So first, let's wrap this with a pair of curly brackets like so. And then let's put the plus sign to concatenate strings. And then let's type item dot page ID. Okay, let's save this and test it out. Let's refresh the page. Let's search for flowers. And you can see that the snippet or the description of the article no longer contains HTML tags. And then when you click on the flower link, Oh yeah, whoops, I made a mistake here. So go back to your editor and replace the forward slash with a question mark like so. And then let's test it out again. Go back. Let's search for books and click the first article. And there you go. However, we want this tab to be opened in another tab. Well, we do this by specifying the target attribute for the anchor tag. So first, let's expand this tag like so, because we've specified more than one attribute to the tag. And then underneath the class name attribute or prop, let's type target equals underscore blank, like so. Let's save this, go back, refresh our app, and then let's type books. Now, if you click on the first article, it opens in another tab. Okay, cool. So we solved the first problem. So now it is fully functional. Let's take a quick pause here. And in the next video, we're going to solve the other problem. In this video, we're going to solve the other problem, which is the key problem. So there's actually a reserved prop in React called key. Key is helpful for React to identify the components that have changed, are added, or are removed from the DOM. Or in other words, when React re-renders the component, it actually checks the content of this component. If it is the same, it's not going to re-render it. However, if it is added, changed, or removed, then React is going to re-render the component. So for lists like this, the only way for React to keep track of elements inside of this array is by the key prop. Also, keys should be unique and constant, so that React doesn't confuse one component with another. Okay, let's specify the key prop here. Let's type key equals, and then let's specify something unique and constant. And for that, we're going to specify the page ID. So let's type item.pageID, like so. Okay, let's save this and test our application. And let's search for books. And you can see that the error no longer appears. Let's solve these warnings now. So if you go to your app.js file, you can see that we actually imported the Axios library for no reason. Okay, let's delete that because we don't want the Axios library inside of the app component. We're using it only in the search component here. So remove it from your app.js file. And then last but not least, we're going to solve this. Okay, go to your list and under the target, let's type another prop called rel equals no referrer. Let's save that. Let's refresh. And you can see that our app works with no errors and no warnings. Let's search for something like cars. There it is. Okay, that's it for our article searcher app. In this video, we're going to deploy our app using Vercel. So first, go ahead and click login. If you don't have an account, click sign up and create an account and then log in through it. So I'm going to log in through my GitHub account because I already created an account using GitHub on this website. And then it's going to take you to the dashboard of your account. After that, open your terminal and inside of your project directory, install the Versal CLI, like so. It's going to take a few seconds. And after installing, just type Versal login. Then it's going to prompt you to enter your email that you created on the Versal website. So I'm going to type it right now. Then it's going to send a verification email to the email that you just entered. So go ahead and check your email. The email is going to be similar to this. And you can see that the security code here matches the security code sent through the email. Then click on verify. And then it's going to say email confirmed. Then simply run Vercel. Hit enter. And it's going to ask you about some questions about your project. 
and then it's gonna take a while in here so I'm gonna skip this part okay after it's done it's gonna give you a URL to your app so copy this and paste it inside of your browser and there you go we deployed our app now you can notice that the seconds counter is not counting on each second because we changed this to be 5000 milliseconds which is 5 seconds so how are we gonna change this and then deploy it on virtual again well it's pretty simple first make your changes like so I'm gonna change this to 1000 milliseconds which is one second and then simply run virtual slash slash prod and then it's gonna take a while as well so I'm gonna skip this part okay after finishing copy this URL and go to it or you can refresh your page and there you go you can see that our app is changed because the counter is working on every second so that's how you deploy on Vercel. In this video, I'm going to show you an alternative way to deploy your app. So inside of your directory, run this command. This command is going to create a production-ready version of your React app, which is a single HTML file followed by some static JavaScript files and CSS files. Okay, let's see how it goes. It's going to take some time. Okay, after completing, go to your directory right here, and you can see that there's a new folder called build. If you open it, you can see that there's a single index.html file here, and you can see a folder called static. This static folder contains your React script compiled to a browser-compatible JavaScript. However, if you, run, if you open the index.html file, you can see that it gives no result at all. And this is because if you open the index.html file inside of your editor and go to the end of your file, you can see that the script tag is actually making a request to this path. And this is because React expects us to host the static folder on a web server and configure it to accept requests like the slash static slash JS and then followed by the JavaScript file name. So make sure when you host this file to actually configure the requests for the slash static slash JS path. However, if you want to run this, when you open the index.html file, you can simply just type a dot in here and do the same for all of the links and script tags. So I'm going to type dot here as well. And in the beginning, I'm going to type a dot here as well so that it shows the icon which is the react icon and that's all we need now okay let's save the file and then open it again you can see that it works now so now you can take the index.html file alongside with the static folder and host them on a static host provider and that's it that's how you deploy your app using the npm run build command